Thanks for joining me for another Blunt Business on CannabisRadio.com. Really appreciate all of you joining us. So I'm happy to bring back a return guest that joined us back in April. And we were talking uh, various areas when it came to branding, marketing, commercial strategy, execution. And just to give a refresher for folks that might have missed our last talk, she's an accomplished executive leader and coach inspiring companies with her vision for what's possible and her ability to execute and drive results. Two, dri- two decades of driving innovation and execution across multiple functional areas. Companies within the start of the Fortune 100, you're talking about companies like Kraft Foods, Kraft Foods, Beam Suntory, Topco Associates, Mizkin, and Mission Dispensaries. And that said, let's come bring back the CEO and principal of LKP Impact Consulting back to the program, Lori Parfit. Lori, thanks for being back on. Thank you for having me. Rolling back to the interview we did previously a few months ago, right off the heels of Benziga Miami. Since then, you've been to MJ Impact Vegas, you went to Benziga Chicago and spoke at those events. You've been speaking quite a bit at a number of events, you know, since we talked. And one of the areas from the last interview we had was you made mention of your role as a fractional CMO. So we've always talked, we've had other guests on the program that talk about where, you know, having someone that might be a chief financial officer outside of the company coming into the space to handle that role in the same way as a CMO that you're doing here as a fractional CMO. So I want you to go ahead and expand on that real quickly. And, you know, what you've been able to do, you've mentioned that off the air, there's been more interest in a position like what you provide. Absolutely. So happy to share. So, you know, I started my cannabis career with Forefront back in early 2019 Mm -hmm. as their head of marketing. And what I quickly learned coming into the industry is that what ends up happening is that operations tend to be prioritized because obviously if you can't produce product, if you can't keep your stores open, all of the marketing in the world isn't going to save you. And so all of these companies started prioritizing market, prioritizing operations during the last capital markets crisis and cut all of their marketing. And as I wanted to stay into the in the industry, I realized that as a CMO, it was important for me to really understand the dynamics that really drive this industry and capital being as constrained as it is. And so we saw that back in 2019, 2020, we're seeing that again right now, is that when you hire a full-time CMO, you're really looking at potentially up to a half a million dollar investment all in with their salary, their benefits, their bonus, their equity. And then once you hire that full-time CMO, they're going to want to hire a team. So one of the fallacies of marketing is that when you're a marketer, you're an expert in everything, which is always really um, an interesting dynamic because when you think about other professions, like I always use medicine, you know, everybody gets a general medical education when they become a physician. But once they get out of med school, they start specializing. Someone becomes a dermatologist. Someone becomes a cardiologist. And so you wouldn't, as a patient, go to your dermatologist for uh, help with your heart condition. And the same thing can be said about marketing, although it seems uh, that most people believe it's a little bit more amorphous. So when you have a CMO, a CMO is generally an expert in a couple of different areas of marketing. And they know how they know enough to be dangerous and to lead the team and find the resources available to make sure that everything works together. Now, Lori, so you hire that. One of the areas I want to talk about when it comes to marketing, and at Cannabis Radio, obviously, we have a lot of marketing professionals we work with on a regular basis to foster and work with clients that we have on that are providing either sponsored programming or and there are other events we also do. And one of the things is always a very a variation. Somebody that might be a director of marketing that we work with once. And, you know, I've had some people that come on that say director of marketing. Well, that might be a position that might get switched around every couple of years, maybe every year or every two to four years for some. And then other companies since 2016, since we've really been in the space so much, they that some of these companies prefer to go and have the PR firms that represent them to handle the marketing for them. Then the other the problem about the purse strings and about how much budget is being allowed for marketing. For some marketers, they don't want to go and spend so much. They want to just try to keep, you know, vigilant and conservative on their on the spending and not put the, themselves at risk of any large projects that might not go well. 
Uh, what do you see about those areas? And what, if a company wants to work with a fractional CMO like yours, no expectations, what what resources are you needing to have at your disposal from them? Sure. So like I was saying earlier, you know, to have your own marketing team is incredibly expensive. So $500,000 for the CMO, plus they're going to need to hire people and hire agencies, et cetera. So before you vet spends any market, uh, any dollars on your marketing, you've really already made a million dollar investment. The average tenure of a CMO in the cannabis space is only about six months. And so in traditional industries, it's about 18 months. So not tremendously better, but a little bit better. Well, I think you're and the one so, that pointed out to me before, and I was where I got the, where it was not a long-term, uh, it was always, in some cases, it was pretty much a, a pretty high turnover. Oh, very high turnover, which is why this model makes a lot more sense because there's so many people out there who want to get a full-time job, but I'm like, it's a full-time job for six months. At that point, you might as well do it on a consulting basis because you will be rotated out very quickly. The second money gets tight, that's exactly what happens. And so there are different ways to skin the cat. Like you talked about, you know, having the PR firm take it on. PR firms are amazing at what they do. They're they're great publicists. But in terms of true marketing, that's really not their area of expertise. And even when I got into a cannabis company, um, they were having, you know, designers kind of lead marketing. And the truth is designers are great designers, but there's a lot more, there are a lot more facets to marketing than design or PR. And so it's really important that you kind of get that holistic perspective. And so the fractional CMO model is really, you know, a part-time executive who comes in and helps lead all that for you. The way we operate, so I started just being a fractional CMO, but as my company evolved, I realized that a lot of my clients needed PR. They needed social media and content creation. They needed creative design. And at the time, I was just outsourcing it and just finding, uh, you know, uh, vendors to help support that. Now I have that all in house. And so the way we describe it and the way we work with clients is we say, you get everything you need for marketing for less than the cost of one person. And that one person is not your CMO. That one person is a marketing director. And so the way you work with us is we we get a, an idea of what it is you need and we scale it to the, to the size of your business. And we make sure that whatever we come up with is at a budget that works for our clients. Now, in your background, where you initially also worked with, uh, in, the, in the dispensaries as well, uh, being Vice President of Consumer Engagement and Marketing for Mission Dispensaries, and that was where nine retail locations in six states so going back into a role like that, if a company has dispensaries, has cultivation, and say, you know, now Ohio is a new market for cannabis. Now, we know that it's a pretty conservative red state politically, and the rollout of such a large state in that respect is not going to be just like it was for New York or New Jersey or, you know, not even like Maryland. It's going to be a different rollout and whatever restrictions or ever any kind of obstacles that might come across to be able to go in start a new market. I mean, any marketing, I would imagine, if there's a new market to go and open up and corner the market, that would be where to go first. Is that a strategy you would take first? And how would you implement a state like Ohio now that it's gone adult use? So it's very exciting that Ohio has made this move. Um, we've been watching it for a while and it's great to see that it's been voted in. And so, yes, to answer your question, that is definitely a market we would target. And we would target it because you're going to have a lot of new operators coming into the space because before it was a medical market. And not only was it a medical market, it was a very conservative medical market. And so now with a going adult use, you're going to start seeing new license holders coming in. You're going to see new brands coming in. And the current operators, even in that market, a lot of them don't do the level of marketing that's needed for a rec state. And so they need people like us to come in who have done this in other markets. So we did this when Illinois went adult use. We've done this in Illinois as we've started to see some of the new licenses roll out. We've looked at New York and New Jersey the same way, Maryland as well. And so it is definitely a great market for us to put our efforts towards 
because so many of those operators need help and need support. And they can't afford at this point as they're trying to raise capital and get their businesses up and running, they can't afford to hire that internally at this point. Stay tuned. We have more Blunt Business coming up after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back to Blunt Business. Now with Ohio also being a market that's already now adult use, if everything goes well with Ohio, we're waiting for the same thing to go ahead and have a green light in Florida. As we speak right mm-hmm. now, there are oral arguments that are being made to the Florida Supreme Court for the safe, Smart and Safe Florida pr- uh, Amendment proposal that's already been put in place. A little bit of pushback political, but so far, things still look pretty good where the language might have been changed. Now there's a chance for Florida to also become a big market. And mm-hmm. in the same respect, that's where you're getting some real ambitious markets coming into play that, you know, that could maybe not go so hard with social equity, maybe not go so hard in terms of you know, they're going to be much more capitalistic, much more revenue driven. Obviously, they want more tax revenue off of what they're going to get. And it's a different environment. Like, do you see anything where Ohio and Florida, if Florida does, if in fact, in 2024, finally get the constitutional amendment passed? I mean, there's obviously the support, just like Ohio had obvious support. Those kind of markets must need a new strategy and there could be a lot more money in it. There absolutely could be. And so, you know, what we take a look at is when these markets start to consider going wreck, we take a look at what what are the current regulations? And then our hope is to see what new regulations are going to pop up. So when you look at Florida, in order to be in Florida right now, you have to be a vertically integrated operator, right? which means you have to have cultivation, manufacturing, and retail all together. That can be very cost prohibitive for smaller operators. So when we think about Florida, what will be interesting is how they shape that rec market. Will it be the same? Will it be different? Um, How many players are going to are they going to let in? Is it going to be limited license versus open licensing? All of those are key considerations when you look at a market like that to determine the viability of the need for these kinds of services going forward. At this point, Florida has been very MSO driven. So True Leave has a very large presence there. We've seen Cresco have a large presence there. And so as they look to move to a rec market, it will be very interesting and telling to see how they write those regulations to see if other operators can come in. And it doesn't mean it needs to be social equity uh, enabled. It can also be that they just have an interest in bringing on smaller operators who would potentially be, have not been able to play in that market, but would be able to now based on how those dynamics have changed. And so Florida is definitely one to watch and one that I'm very interested in because I think there is a lot of runway depending on how they create the rules and regulations. At the same time, we also thought the same thing would be the case in New York. And um, and so that's a market that we were all very bullish on probably a year ago. And that market went adult use. And unfortunately, what we've seen is a lot of shifting around of how they've implemented that policy, um, some gray areas on the rules and regulations. And um, it's been a little bit of a challenge to move into that market. And so as we start to see these markets open up, it's going to be very telling as to how they write their regulations. And that's going to make the difference, I believe, in being a very successful market versus one that um, that's going to have uh, struggles going forward. You said it right. When it comes to Florida, very MSO based. And obviously now some of these MSOs are just buying each other, buying off of other MSOs are just the bigger ones are just kind of swallowing up the others and a and a bureau buy to go and make sure to control the market. So you got Planet 13 buying Vitacan, Cresco Labs, you just made mention of buying one plant Florida. And then you got Air Wellness coming into the space uh, back in 2020. So much of that is just kind of just buying up and going buying up. And I'm seeing that all the time where I'll see, you know, a sunny side of the dispensary, which bought other companies that well, that's now Cresco Labs. And you see these changes all and then there's sanctuary and there's all these others are just rolling up on each other. So you're going to basically have about 
maybe about five or six brands that will be prominent throughout the state of Florida. I can see Orlando, uh, sorry, Ohio fall on the same trend. Now, when it comes to the role of the fractional CMO, for a company like these, obviously, I'm pretty sure you have some MSOs in your portfolio that you're, you're providing help with as a fractional CMO or your team is. There is the part we talked about extensively on this program and our Blunt Business Series about the DHS. There would be the HHS Health and Human Services, the possibility of scheduling, most likely the scheduling by the DEA, Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, because what is the important, you know, the nugget they get out of this, the signal above the noise, is the fact that there will be the clause of 280E, the Inter Internal Revenue Service Code, will no longer apply for cannabis companies, and that revenue, the write-off, so many expenses, can go back to them. And for some companies, I'm sure they're going to be ambitious. They're going to try to recoup from past years. And there'll probably be a court case of that. I know I talked to an accounting uh, specific lawyer telling me about that, that that's going to be a case someday a company will try to do that as president and we'll see how it works out, which would get to very well be to take that away to help all these companies get back. So that kind of revenue coming in, to be able to put that into a marketing budget, even though, you know, the marketing it's going to be difficult because of social media restrictions. What you could put on billboards, you can't put anything up on the radio or TV yet. Although a lot of things are trying to be pushed around for those kind of avenues to open up. If some of that money came in to the coffers and a company says, let's put, let's go ahead and reinvest this into marketing, you know, how much would that, how much significant help would that be for someone like yourself to help a business grow? It would be a huge impact. So, you know, the issue with 280E is that a lot of these companies cannot deduct normal expenses that other companies in alternative industries can deduct. And a lot of that comes down to human capital, it comes down to marketing. All of those can be deducted by um, companies in, say, CPG or pharma. And in cannabis, because of 280E, it can't be. And so that has partially hamstrung our industry because the tax implications in general are so high. And then these normal deductible expenses, you can't utilize. And so that creates major cash flow issues for these companies. And it's very interesting to me because people, when they find out I'm in the cannabis space, are always like, oh, there's so much money there. They're all swimming in money. And I'm like, you know, what you don't understand is that 280E, the, the federal tax code, doesn't allow a lot of these businesses to really reap the benefits of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons marketing has always been, you know, somewhat of an afterthought is you have to spend money on it. And if you don't have that cash mm -hmm. flow, then it becomes more problematic. And so if cannabis gets rescheduled to schedule three, I would anticipate that opening a lot of cash flow for these operators, which they are more likely to spend on things like innovation, marketing, and expansion versus just trying to keep their lights on. Stay tuned. We have more Blunt Business coming up after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back to Blunt Business. And imagine some of these publicly traded companies being able to go put that back on their their books. And then you'll see that just an in increase of you know uh, less debt, more available cash flow. Then all these companies are also going to benefit from the fact that these numbers are going to come in for the quarterly reports. And they're going to say, oh, you know what? Let's put more investment in. More money is going to come into that. Which not, not a lot of people are probably talking about that, but that would be also a consideration. So there's money to be made, money to get back in, reinvest. It's just a matter of, I think it's all a matter of not if, but when. Whenever in 2024, before the presidential election, that is what has been said most likely will happen. So then implement it 2025, and then you're saying to yourself, okay, you got this now in place. Who are going to be the smart ones that will reinvest this money and not just pocket the cash? That's the point I got to look at. And I think that reinvestment offer is, is really what needs to work, and that's where a company like yours bringing in a fractional CMO that's the level of investment that you need. Just that right there annually will be just enough to go and get the investment in to help really grow the business, whichever that might be, uh, large scale, small business, whatever it might be. So, you know, 
I wish I had the crystal ball to say who's going to reinvest and who's not. Yes. Um, but you know, what I tell operators all the time are gone are the days where, you know, people are lining up, up over, all around the block for your dispensary or for a new drop. And so we now have to become competitive. And we see this in every market as it matures. So if you look at California and Washington State, Oregon, Colorado, we see a lot of these markets down. And it's because the competition has gotten so severe there. And as we see some of these markets open up, that competition is going to continue to build. And so it's not going to be enough just to have your doors open. Like if you build it, they will come. Or if you create a brand, they will just buy it because it's there. Now you have to find ways to truly differentiate yourself in order to be successful. And so I would say that the smart operators are going to start investing in marketing because they know that they have to, if they have dispensaries, they have to create foot traffic. If they have a brand, they need to find ways to engage with that consumer to create that stickiness. And so I would say, you know, a lot of the small to mid-sized operators, they are investing as much as they possibly can in marketing right now. Yeah. But I think that if 280E goes away, they will start doing more and they will need to do more because with that change, you're going to start seeing a lot more players wanting to come into the industry and you're going to start seeing some of the other tangential industries, so alcohol and pharma and CPG, as they start seeing this unwind, they're going to start dipping their toes a little bit more. Yeah. And that's going to create a lot of competition for retailers, for brands, and for everyone. And so I would hope that they would start investing in marketing. But when you work with someone like us, you don't have to invest too much in marketing. And we would never suggest you know, the 15 to 20% that a lot of these businesses in other sectors invest. Mm -hmm. We say, let's keep it lean. Let's keep it easy. We want an ROI on everything we're doing. We have real goals and objectives, and we make sure that it can be at a, a size and scale that works for cannabis operators. And I think that's the key. Having come from CPG myself, traditional CPG, I worked for Kraft and Beam Suntory, you know, we all had big budgets at those companies. And when those people come into this space, and when I came into this space, I had to learn very quickly that those kind of budgets don't exist in the cannabis world, nor should they. And the key to success in cannabis is knowing what to take from other industries and what to leave behind. And you have to be a very scrappy marketer in cannabis to be truly effective. And one of the reasons for that is that every state of the union operates as a separate country. And so you have to approach each market differently. You have to have different marketing tactics. You mentioned you know, TV and radio. We can't do some of those things. Social media you know, is a challenge because we're violating Meta's terms of service by being on their platforms. You can do LinkedIn because it's more friendly towards that. And uh, Twitter or what they're calling X now is also a little bit friendlier. And you can do out of home. So billboards and stuff like that in certain states and in certain jurisdictions. But what where the rubber meets the road is really understanding your brand, making sure you have those true differentiation points and making sure that you activate it the right way in each state, which could mean repositioning it in each state. And so that's where marketing is going to really uh, take hold is that need to understand the different market dynamics and ensure that the plan you're putting together is going to be effective for where you are. I'm going to unpack a couple of things. So when you're doing CPG for a bigger company like a Kraft Foods or Beam Suntory, that's worldwide and national exposure. The cannabis companies can't do that yet. And it's already hard enough for them alone to go and be able to go and build cultivation and then the branding, or have to outsource to get their product in place in various markets. So they have to go and build the same outfit replicated over and over in each state. So there's it's also going to be taken away from that until we get legalization. You can't even do any transport of a from state to state, or just even going in and ship or and you know take it across the state lines. 
Then there's a part where when it comes to what kind of reinvestment that we can expect from companies, right now, for all the people I've gauged that I've actually asked the question about when it comes to the DEA and HHS, this descheduling and the 280 taking away and the kind of write-offs that are coming, all those companies will just tell me, well, they're crutching the numbers right now. We're trying to go ahead and put into account and in their future business plan, what those numbers are going to look like in maybe 2025 and going forward. What money is going to be available? That's what they're looking at right now. Not even doing much more, but just speculation and just more crushing the numbers just to know what they're going to be able to work with in terms of the cash flow in upcoming years. Otherwise, that's it. Lori, so I'm going to wrap things up and real quickly just make mention of getting that call to action for why a fractional CMO at this point in this juncture right now, being lean and mean, being you know efficient and offering the resources necessary with an understanding that you said it earlier in the interview, you know, there's PR companies that could, you know, try to go and do the job that what really a CMO should be doing, but they're only limited in some cases to what they're able to do as a company. So to do what you're doing, like you said, to have something that either you outsource or you're able to bring in internally, the publicity efforts, the branding, the marketing, all those efforts for exposure, Omni-channel, you know, various areas of sales strategies, that's where a fractional CMO is best useful. So for those that look at LKP Impact, and what, what website, by the way, is lkpimpact.com, uh, Lori, what is it that you would tell people right now, companies that are listening to you, that would see, okay, well, we have this kind of setup, but, you know, if we wanted to consider a fractional CMO, what would be the best way, the best reason why? I think the best reason why is you are at that point where you are at that inflection point where you could either stay flat or decline or you could increase your revenue, but you don't have enough cash flow to hire a full-time team. A fractional CMO is the best option for you because it works at the size and scale that your business is at and provide you with that leadership, that guidance. And in in our case, we provide you all of the execution and functional support of a marketing team. It allows you to take your business to the next level. So if you are ready to take your business to the next level, a fractional marketing team is the best option for you. It'll be the most affordable and produce the best results. I, I understand where you're coming from. I might have talked, uh, spoken with a handful of people that are marketing professionals, seasoned pros with, you know, a Swiss army knife full of resources at their disposal, but they're not that many coming into this space. They're few and far between. So this option where it's not just the CMO, when they, anybody hears that word fractional CMO, it's not just one person. It is a team. It's basically a firm of professionals that are going to be rolling in that one role. So that's why it works so well. And it's multifaceted for what the investment that you put in. And if it's possibly that reinvestment that you're able to put with what happens in 2025, that descheduling decision, that's a good point. That's a good way to go and start this. And just keep in mind, more markets will come in. You don't want to be in the back seat, just trying to go ahead and go along to get along. You want to continue to grow. You want to continue to get move forward. And you want to make sure your product gives out the more customers. So I understand exactly what you're trying to say when it comes to having a fractional CMO in the cannabis space in any various MSO or business that should consider. So again, website, lkpimpact.com. Uh, Lori, uh, also, can you give us an idea going into next year, into 2024, uh, what you, uh, where people can go and find you. I don't know if you're going to be at MJ Biz coming up, which as we're recording right now, and, you know, obviously you're out in a lot of places. People can go ahead and really find you. How can they stay connected with you in the meantime? Sure. So you can always go to my website or email me at Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E, at LKPimpact.com. I will be at MJ Biz. I'm actually speaking. I have a solo speech on the no jerk rule, how to avoid and survive price compression. And I will be, um, I speak every month here in Chicago for Tony P's Cannabis Events. So if you want to find me in Chicago, please do so. And then I come to most of the big cannabis conferences. So my plan next year 
is to be at the Canna Reg Summit. I sit on the board of that. That's through Smithers. That's usually around the March time frame. I plan to be at Benzinga and MJ Unpacked, uh, both of the ones they have scheduled for next year. And then I also speak at Cannabis Conference, which is through Cannabis Business Times. They do a conference in August at the Paris Hotel. And I sit on the board of that and I speak at that every year as well. So I'm around. I will be in Vegas for MJ BizCon. Please come find me. I would love to talk to anybody who wants to have a conversation. Lori Parfit again with me, CEO and principal of LKP Impact Consulting. Thank you for being on with us and thanks again for making time for us. Thank you so much for having me.